I'd like to end up this discussion by talking about antimicrobial compounds that are used to treat bacterial infections. And think, we have a bacterial infection in us. We need to treat them with drugs that will kill the bacteria but will not harm us. In other words, the antibiotics or antimicrobial compounds have to be selective. They have to target things in the bacteria that are not present in our cells. Fortunately, this is relatively easy to do because bacteria are very different from eukaryotic cells. I'll give you an example of such selectivity. There is a class of antibiotics called the beta-lactam antibiotics. And these include the penicillins, the cephalosporins, and the carbapenems. They're, they're called beta-lactam antibiotics because they have a chemical ring in them called the beta-lactam ring. These antibiotics target the synthesis of murine. Now, do you remember from an earlier lecture what murine is? In gram-positive bacteria, this forms a thick layer on the outside of the bacterium just above the cell membrane. And it's composed of sugar molecules joined together and cross-linked by amino acids of short length. On the right of this slide is a diagram of the synthesis of murine. Murine is exclusive to bacteria. It does not occur in eukaryotic cells. And on this slide are four different antibiotics, phosphomycin, cycloserine, vancomycin, and penicillin, which block different steps on the synthesis of murine. So these antibiotics work beautifully because murine is only in bacteria and not in our cells, so they have very, very little toxicity. And you can see we have developed over the years antibiotics that target different steps in the synthesis of murine, including penicillin, uh, that last step, which is assembling the cross-linking amino acids between the sugar chains. Unfortunately, as, as we develop new antimicrobial compounds, resistance to them rapidly emerges. And today, we have resistance to almost every antimicrobial compound that we have developed, and, and the situation is becoming dire because we have fewer and fewer options with which to treat bacterial infections. Antimicrobial resistance occurs in nature, and it's ancient. Bacteria make antibiotics to compete with each other in nature, and many of those we have harnessed uh, to use as antimicrobial treatments of infections of people. We know that these genes that confer resistance have been around for thousands and thousands of years. We can find them in very old sites on Earth, and there's plenty of evidence that they existed way before humans developed any antimicrobial compounds. So we're really taking advantage of something that exists uh, in nature. There are a number of mechanisms by which these antimicrobial genes, or I should say antimicrobial resistance genes, work. Uh, for example, they may direct the synthesis of an enzyme that breaks down the drug, a, a simple way of doing resistance. They may chemically modify the drug so it interferes with its function. They could inhibit the uptake of the drug into cells and tissues so it can no longer access its target. Or they could stimulate the export of the drug from the bacterial cell so it's no longer bactericidal or they may modify the target site of the drug. So there are many different mechanisms of antimicrobial resistance. And again, these are all encoded on genes that code for proteins that have these various activities. Let's take an example to illustrate that. And we'll use an example, uh, the antibiotic vancomycin. Its target is cell wall modification. So vancomycin acts by blocking the assembly of the murine cell wall. Now, at the top of this slide is the normal incorporation of the precursors of murine. So the blue and the uh, green ovals, those are sugar molecules that are gonna be part of the growing peptidoglycan chain. And the smaller ovals below them, those are amino acids that will eventually cross-link the murine to make it very strong. So the way this works is that subunits are added to the growing chain in the second part of 
this, in the second row of this diagram, you can see the growing polypeptide chain. Vancomycin binds to the precursors by binding to the amino acid. Vancomycin is shown here in purple with the V, or maybe that's brown, and it's binding the amino acids and blocking the incorporation into the new chain. Therefore, this inhibits murine synthesis and kills the bacteria. Resistance to vancomycin, it, one mechanism of resistance, is simply that the bacterium changes the diala diala to diala dlac, and lactose can be incorporated into the, this chain. It, it, it evades vancomycin resistance, and the antibiotic no longer works. That's one example of the way resistance works. Going back to our beta-lactam antibiotics, which I mentioned before, and the arrow points to the beta-lactam ring. That's common to all members of this class. That's why we call them beta-lactams. We have so far identified over 300 beta-lactamases. These are enzymes that cut that beta-lactam ring. And these beta-lactamases encode resistance to the beta-lactam antibiotics. So you can see the extent of the problem. Beta-lactamases are everywhere. Further complicating antibiotic resistance is that the genes encoding resistance factors, for example, uh, that encode beta-lactamases, are often able to move from bacterium to bacterium. One way to do that is via plasmids. And in fact, many of these antibiotic resistance genes are encoded on plasmids. This diagram, which we saw previously in one of our other lectures, shows how plasmids can move from one bacterial cell to another. On the upper left is a bacterial cell with a chromosome in green and a smaller plasmid in red. Let's say this plasmid encodes a beta-lactamase, which confers resistance to beta-lactams to that bacterium. Well, in the second set of bacteria, the two bacteria are now exchanging DNA through a pelis that's joining the two cells, and the plasmid is moving from one cell to another. The result is that that second cell now acquires antibiotic resistance. So, you know, a problem here is that we, we often fee, feed our animals that we eat for food lots of antibiotics, so they grow quickly. The effect is that we select for antimicrobial resistance in the animals, and then when we eat these foods, we acquire antibiotic resistance genes in us, which are of no consequence initially, but then when we go to have surgery and we need antibiotic therapy, it doesn't work because we have the resistance already in us. So these antibiotic resistance genes can move around bacteria extensively. This is why they're a problem, not just by plasmid mobility, but by also uh, movement by transduction, the exchange of pieces of DNA uh, by viruses or simply by naked DNA. So gene transfer among bacteria, we call this horizontal gene transfer, is widespread and is a big problem for antimicrobial resistance. And let's end up with a chart showing you some common mechanisms of resistance to antimicrobial agents. For example, the penicillins and the cephalosporins uh, are hydrolyzed by beta-lactamases, which we mentioned. These resistance genes are, in fact, carried on plasmids. Methicillin resistance uh, is a change in the penicillin binding protein, not in a beta-lactamase, but in a separate protein. This happens not to be carried on a plasmid. Uh, tetracycline resistance uh, encodes a pump that pushes the drug out of the bacterial cell. This is a plasmid-borne resistance factor. So if you look at all these various mechanisms of resistance, modification of the drug, um, synthesis of alternate substrates, and so forth, acetylation, change in binding sites, look how many are encoded on plasmids. And that simply means that they're easy to go from bacterium to bacterium, and we have a hard time treating bacterial infections when these resistance genes are so mobile.